right, we'll get, we're getting started a little late here. Um, it's the last session right over. Um, but, uh, but let's get going so we're not uh, wasting any time. Uh, what we're going to talk about is Cloud Foundry on OpenStack and kind of what we've gone through uh, as IBM running our Cloud Foundry platforms on OpenStack, kind of challenges we ran into, how we worked through them, and I uh, went from there. So if you're not familiar with OpenStack, I'd, I'd be surprised, but it's a uh, IaaS cloud operating system, open source. So we use it internally for our um, infrastructure as a service platforms. There are other companies that use it. Uh, the key pieces to OpenStack, we call the core services, Nova Neutron, Swift, Cinder, Keystone, Glance, their compute, networking, storage, object storage, block storage, uh, authentication, and image storage. So these are the core components to OpenStack uh, that you would need if you were running Cloud Foundry on it. Obviously, we're at Cloud Foundry Summit, so you have a pretty good idea, hopefully, what Cloud Foundry is. Um, so we've, IBM as a whole has been involved in Cloud Foundry uh, for, for quite some time now, um, both on our public Bluemix platform as well as our, our, our private platforms. So if you're familiar with the way Cloud Foundry works, um, use Bosch as the, uh, as the deployment and lifecycle management tool for Cloud Foundry. So this is how you deploy and run Cloud Foundry. And the way you deploy it on different platforms is what's called the CPI, uh, Cloud Provider Interface. So Cloud Provider Interface tells Bosch how to talk to the underlying uh, components. So there's uh, CPIs for AWS, CPIs for VMware. There's also a CPI for OpenStack. Uh, there's some other ones. Uh, IBM, we've created one specifically for software, and I know there's, there's some other newer ones out there to deploy directly on bare metal and, and things like that. So the, the CPI is really what tells Bosch how to talk to the underlying layer. So when you're doing a Cloud Foundry deploy, there's a bunch of different components. So Bosch is the, the mechanism that does it. Uh, one of the key things you need is what's this called a stem cell. So this is your base OS that you're going to deploy onto that cloud that all those other pieces are going to be put on. So in that release is the version, which software packages, configurations, all the components that are going to make up that Cloud Foundry release that you're going to deploy. And then it's all tied together in a manifest. So the manifest basically tells Bosch what to deploy, where, what the networks are, all those type of components. So all those together um, is how Bosch deploys Cloud Foundry onto underlying IaaS. So starting with the problems uh, that we ran into, uh, not just with IBM, but what we've seen and, and from talking to other Cloud Foundry teams, uh, they, they ran into when trying to deploy on OpenStack. Key one's instability, uh, especially with the earlier releases of OpenStack, different APIs, API changes, uh, API performances, all those types of things. Um, and they change between releases. Some people would deploy uh, their OpenStack, it wouldn't be a contigu contiguous release, so they'd use some services from one version, some, ver some from another. Uh, capacity, so this is where we've seen uh, OpenStack uses flavors similar to AWS, so where you have like uh, VM sizes, and they're not always ideal for Cloud Foundry out of the box. So what happens is you end up with a lot of wasted resources because you're using the next size flavor up. Um, networking. How, you know, you already, if you're doing something like OpenStack, you're probably doing some sort of um, software-defined networking or network encapsulation, and then you're throwing Cloud Foundry on top of that. So how does that all play together well? Um, the other thing is enterprise software. So, um, hey, cool, we deployed our Cloud Foundry, you know, our, our DEAs or in Diego or whatever, but we need these other pieces, say, a commercial software package we want to run, Oracle. Uh, for a for a data service behind it, well, that may not have been supported on OpenStack. That was another another challenge we saw. Uh, and and really, what you're trying to do, and the the idea with CPIs and the way Bosch works, is to be able to make them really generic, so we can just swap out the CPI and deploy the same to different different uh, IaaS layers. But the problem is they they're different enough where you can't really get to that layer. Uh, and then the other thing we run into with is if we've had, we have customers and had customers who said, well, we want both. So we need IaaS for some of our stuff and then we want Cloud Foundry for the other stuff. So we want them all in the same layer. And then it's how do you handle permissioning? So for example, the credentials you gave to Bosch can't step all over the VMs that the users are creating individually and, and vice versa. Um, HA, what works, what doesn't? How, how do we provide availability for all the Cloud Foundry components uh, and, you know, as long, and as well as the OpenStack components? 
And then the constant release cycle. So OpenStack does major releases twice a year. Cloud Foundry has a pretty aggressive release cycle as well. So how do we you know, get it deployed and then be able to keep up with those releases? Uh, so there was a survey um, someone um, from IBM did asking people kind of what they were running into with OpenStack with Cloud Foundry. So what's your level of experience? You can see most have, have had some experience and you can see you know, what, how much difficulty did you have with it. You can see the biggest one was significant difficulty deploying Cloud Foundry on OpenStack. Uh, as we dug into that a little bit more, do you have to customize anything? You know, it's almost 50-50, you know, making customizations to, to get it deployed in their environment. And the, the two biggest ones here you can see from a, what were the biggest issues with Bosch? Uh, instability OpenStack environments that they were working on, as well as the difficulty getting the initial setup going. So then we asked more like, what, what version do you use in this? This survey is a little old, but you can see it's a couple releases behind. And then what type of OpenStack? Is it locally managed, remotely managed, all those kinds of things. So most of these environments were their local um, OpenStack environment. So talking about that real quick, what we, what we use at IBM, our, our OpenStack is, is called Bluebox. It's a managed OpenStack offering. So we take care of all that for the clients. We operate it. All they do is consume it. So whether you do it in a soft layer data center or in, uh, in a customer's own data center. We remotely manage it, upgrade it, keep it, keep it running, troubleshoot it, all those types of things. And we provide all the, the usual OpenStack services in a, in a highly available fashion. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, we have a tool called Ursula, which is open sourced. It's, it's kind of a wrapper around Ansible. That allows us to deploy these OpenStack environments uh, very quickly in a very controlled manner. We get very good repeatability out of them and also upgradability. So like for example, uh, the, the latest um, full release of OpenStack is Mitaka, uh, which came out earlier this year. All of our customers' clouds are already upgraded to Mitaka, uh, which you, know, you can see some people are even just starting to look at doing that. And the only way we've been able to do that is automation and orchestration uh, through our tooling. So by doing that, you know, when, when Bluebox got acquired by IBM last year uh, and the Bluemix team got to see you know, a very good, stable OpenStack environment that they could start to deploy to, uh, that's when we started mixing that in. So if, if you're not familiar with Bluemix, um, which when I first came to IBM, I, I was just thought, well, Bluemix is, is IBM's Cloud Foundry, but then there's a lot of other components to it. So all the backing services and additional things like that. Uh, but, but the core of it is still Cloud Foundry. Uh, so it's, it's a very large uh, environment we offer as a public facing Cloud Foundry uh, environment, as well as where we're focusing here with the OpenStack is dedicated and private, so single tenant, either in a software data center or in customer's data center. And, and Bluemix can get pretty complex once you start pulling in those other non-Cloud Foundry things. So besides the base Cloud Foundry stuff, we have things like uh, container service, and uh, you know, we can do GitHub Enterprise and all these other pieces so that it's not just beyond the basic Bosch install of the, the Cloud Foundry components, but it, it's all the other pieces around it. So what did, what did, we, what did we learn? Um, well, first thing here is the f best place to start is if you have a Cloud Foundry environment, is there's a, there's a good uh, information on the foundation's website to validate your OpenStack environment. You know, some basic things you can find out um, to check to make sure you have in place before you even try to deploy. Uh, and there's also a, um, a, a newer project uh, called the uh, OpenStack Validator, which you can actually run against your OpenStack environment, and it'll test a bunch of the API calls that the, that the cloud CPI would make anyway, and make sure they work, again, before you go and deploy. Because depending on the, the size of your environment, the performance of your equipment, you know, Cloud Foundry can take a little while to deploy. So you don't want to start a deployment and then you know it's going to fail anyway. So you can run this tool first and it'll check all your settings and tell you kind of like a pre-flight check to say, hey, this is, we, we couldn't delete a disk or we couldn't delete a VM or you know, there was some bad permissions, something like that. Uh, this tool gives you the ability to, to see that. <coughs> Sizing. So I mentioned earlier the, the default flavors. Uh, what we've done is we've gone with uh, custom flavors to match the different components of Cloud Foundry. Uh, so you can see here the DEAs, uh, router, core nodes, service gateways. Uh, we have different, and that's what we, we start our flavors with CF for these. So we have these, how many gigs of RAM, how much disk, 
Uh, so we use those, and then you can see the different counts of all the other ones. Um, and then on the right side, to the amount of persistent disk. So this is our this is our internal we use for base sizing for starting the a Cloud Foundry core deployment. So it uses a good bit of resources to get started, um, but we found using these settings and these sizes has has given us the most efficient use of the resources we could uh, we can use under based on the underlying <coughs> open stack environment. So now we get into to scale, the scalability piece is usually the next question. Cool, we got it up and running initially. How do we scale from here? So on, on the public cloud side, we've scaled, you know, we've proven Cloud Foundry can scale extremely large to, uh, to tens of thousands of machines and, and things like that. But what about in a private OpenStack environment? So this is where we found that um, starting with that base consumption right there you see in the blue, that's kind of where we get started. Um, you know, how many, you need 32 cores, 700 gigs of RAM, six terabytes of disk, and 1.5 terabytes that being persistent disk. So this is the, your, your base starting. And as we've scaled some of these customer environments, we found kind of like what those blocks are as they go. So you can see, uh, based on that initial starting point, that gets you one terabyte of application memory. So you know, depending on how many gigs or megabytes you give to each runtime, um, you know, that's how you could chop that up. But that will get you a terabyte uh, right there. So each, the assumption we make and how we've been deploying is each DEA, and this is all based on DEAs, not Diego, uh, a four core 32 gig machines. So every time we add 28 additional machines, we get an additional terabyte of application capacity. So that's kind of, that's like our sizing numbers we've worked off of where every time we want to add, um, so we brand it to, to an even 32. So we say every terabyte of application memory, 32 DEAs, uh, so it makes it pretty easy when we do sizing to, to work off those numbers. And each of those 32 DEAs when set up use 12 terabytes of data store capacity. Um, then as we get larger, we start you know, growing you know, things, more log aggregators, more, every, every three terabytes added, we had another API worker and another Go router. Um, once you get into the services, those are really service dependent. So if it's something um, smaller, you know, or larger, that's really depends on the service, whether it's a Redis or MySQL or, or, or whatever you're using for your backing services. It's totally based on that individual service. So some of our services are lightweight that we use, and some of them are really heavyweight. Another thing we've seen is the, um, especially during a deploy, Bosch can be, um, can hit the API really hard, asking for resources and configuring things. There's no sort of, rate limiting on it. Uh, so we need to make sure the, we, the API um, settings for OpenStack turned up to increase the limits. So that way we don't get timeouts and we, because we don't want the Bosch deployment failing doing, uh, due to the lack of, of API resources. So, uh, oh, this is another thing we, we've run into is name-based security groups where uh, in, in OpenStack you can you create security groups. They have a UUID, but you can also give them a name. Um, so when it does it by name, when you give it a name, the first thing it has to do is go across the message bus to the database to find out the UUID of that security group before you do anything with it. So it just adds a lot of extra overhead where if you can reference the security groups by UUID, you're skipping an additional transaction. Uh, so that, that's, we saw, you know, reduced a lot of overhead uh, on the back end. This is uh, the next one, Neutron. So we use in, uh, on, the, on the private side for Bluebox, we use um, Linux Bridge with provider networks and VXLAN. Uh, but if you're using Open vSwitch, depending on the networking technology you're using, you have to be careful of your MTUs. Because uh, by default, if you're using a standard MTU, say on the, the physical host of 1500 and you haven't changed it, and then you're using VXLAN, you already cut that down. Uh, so you start to. Hang on. Sorry. Um, you can use the, uh, you need to turn it down because you can see 1400 or 1460, depending if it's GRE or VXLAN, um, you'll run into problems with that anyway. If you don't, you know, outside of just even Cloud Foundry, once you start getting, you know, networks inside of networks inside of networks. Um, also the, you can change the compute scheduler driver as well to try and balance it based on uh, instead of the, the default scheduler. So you want to balance it based on 
uh, unload, which is obviously when you're standing up a lot of DEAs, this is, uh, this is a, a, a key piece of that. On the Bosch side, on the Cloud Foundry side, NAT's timeouts are, are, can be a challenge anyway. Um, when you have a lot of components that are, that are talking, if you're not familiar, NATS is the message bus for, for Cloud Foundry. So increasing that timeouts um, gives it a little bit more, it's a little bit more um, resilient then in dealing with some of these issues because it'll wait a little longer for, uh, for these pieces to come back to it. So as that grows, that's, uh, that's something that can get, um, you can start running into a problem with pretty, pretty quickly. Um, isolating components with multiple networks. So this is where you can kind of get more efficient with your network allocation. Again, at the smaller side, it's not as important, but as it scales, this is where you start to run into problems and delays and, and congestion that can cause, you know, kind of this, all these pieces that need to talk to each other start to have challenges. Um, also, any of the stuff that is communicating inside the OpenStack environment. So if you're not familiar with OpenStack, it is the concept of private networks and then floating IPs. Floating IPs are the public IPs to talk to the outside world. Uh, so generally, the, the best practice is anything, any of the pieces communicating with each other, even your own. So, so like, let's say you're using uh, Elk as your logging destination. So you're gonna log everything to Elk. You need to have the, uh, you know, the, the logs coming from Loggergator and from, from Cloud Foundry to go there. If you go out through the, floating IPs, you're going through the net, uh, Neutron router, so you're adding additional processing that needs to happen and more load on your cloud, versus if they can go, if they can be directly connected with inside the private network, you'll, uh, you'll cut down a lot of extra overhead. Uh, so that way they can communicate directly without adding any additional uh, routing. Especially if they're both on your, one less, if you're both in the OpenStack environment, you have floating IPs on both, now you're doing it both ways. So it's hitting the router in both directions. So if you can have them talk over the private network, you'll save yourself a lot of uh, overhead. This stuff is, um, you know, is where you start getting into, some of it is kind of common sense, like, hey, don't open ports that you don't need. <laughs> Keep to the minimum, that's, that's kind of basic uh, computer hygiene type stuff. But the, um, the other thing is when you get into certificates, certificates can always be a challenge with anything. If you are using self-signed certs, you have to include in your manifest the location of the CA that signed the cert. Um, I recommend not using self-signed certs because they're so easy to get certs now with stuff like Let's Encrypt. Um, using self-signed certs are just asking for problems. Uh, the other thing, don't use full admin credentials on your Bosch manifest. So when you give the manifest, you have to give it OpenStack credentials so it can go build all this stuff. Um, if you're giving it full admin credentials, it can literally do anything to your, to your underlying OpenStack cloud. Uh, you know, delete entire networks, delete entire machines, um, whatever. And yeah, minimize your use of floating IPs as much as possible. Uh, every single node doesn't need to have a floating IP. Uh, only the things that need to actually communicate with the, the external network, so if you're using you know, whatever kind of load balancer, for example, if using F5 or HA proxy or data power or one of those, obviously they need to be, have a public facing IP address, um, but all the individual uh, CF components don't need to have uh, public IP addresses. On the, you know, when I say public, I mean just outside the OpenStack cloud. That could be still on your private internal network. So this also another challenge too is how some of these components will get out to the internet to get new releases um, or even during the initial deployment. So the Bosch, when you, in the manifest, you tell it which release you want to use, it's going to go out, pull it in, and then deploy it. Uh, so if you're behind a firewall or proxy and it's limited in its ability to get it to the internet, you're going to have a problem because Bosch is going to be able to pull its components in. And then depending on the components you're deploying, some of them are being compiled and built locally too. So again, it has to pull, that, pull those things down. Um, so, from an OpenStack perspective, you don't need to have a public floating IP to get to the internet. But what, what we've seen catch a lot of customers up is they say, oh, well, we, we need to give this VM access and it has this private IP address and we give it outbound 443 access. And then it still doesn't work. And the reason is, is if it does not have its floating IP, all the source from the rest of your network's perspective, all the source traffic is coming from that gateway IP. So you're actually letting the gateway IP out uh, over 443 or, or whatever. Um, also, Cloud Foundry out of the box um, does not support SSL packet inspection. So 
what we've seen uh, a lot of larger, especially in larger companies, they'll do um, have a different certificate that they've trusted to inspect all the SSL traffic um, going off their network. So basically, they're doing a man in the middle. Uh, Cloud Foundry does not handle that. So in these cases, when they need to go out to the internet to get those things, we generally customers have had to whitelist the Cloud Foundry environment to say, don't do SSL pack inspection on these IPs because it just won't work then. So break it. The only thing it'll work with is one that's if it's an internet authority signed certificate. So from my experience, most customers don't. They have a self-signed internal cert because they can push that CA cert to all their laptops or whatever. So they're like, that's fine. They don't want to pay for an external cert. And this is the type of stuff it breaks. As I mentioned earlier, optimizing capacity. So um, making sure that your OpenStack flavors are right to match your Cloud Foundry deploy. So as you see, the defaults in OpenStack come they're very similar to the AWS ones. They start with M, you know, M1 small, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, is we create a set of flavors specifically for um, for Cloud Foundry. So we start with CF and then the different size machines for the different roles. Uh, so that way we can get the, the sizes down as much as possible. Um, the other thing you'll run into, if you're not familiar with this part of uh, OpenStack, OpenStack is the concept of a metadata service. So cloud init, when a VM boots, it actually connects to a you know, internal um, HTTP address and pulls down its config information. That's where you can feed it additional details of what to do when it boots up. So hey, when you boot up, then run this script or, or things like that. Some people have that turned off and they use a thing called config drive instead, which is instead of it going to an HTTP address, it mounts an ISO that, you know, it mounts what looks like to it as a CD-ROM drive. So you actually have to configure that uh, in your Bosch manifest, otherwise it'll fail when it goes to deploy because it can't figure out how to tell the VMs what to do. So that's something that uh, we ran into and we saw customers and why it wasn't working. It turned out they had the metadata service turned off. This is, this is one of the bigger challenges is if you're going to share this environment with, uh, with non-Cloud Foundry workloads. So we have some customers there. The, Cloud Found, the OpenStack's only there just to run Cloud Foundry. In other cases, they, they want to run other workloads and have Cloud Foundry also. Uh, so the challenges can be here are the going back to the credentials. So admin is too much. Uh, but some of the individual tenant admins are not enough. Um, so what you really have to do is you can't use any of the out-of-the-box roles. What we generally recommend is specialized roles just for Bosch to use for Cloud Foundry where, hey, it's a tenant admin, but it also has some, um, some higher level stuff like the ability to, to change flavors. And I a, quotas are a big one. Uh, modifying quotas is really an admin thing, not a tenant admin thing. So that's, that's something we've run into too. So you end up having to create a specific role just for deploying uh, Cloud Foundry. Like I mentioned, OpenStack, we have two releases a year at a minimum, right? The major releases, and there's point releases in between, and, and, uh, and then there's, it's a continuous deployment model. So there may be hot fixes or bugs or patches that need to go in as well. So how do we keep that rolling without taking down the Cloud Foundry environment? Um, moving from one release to another. In the earlier days, people would do, so they do like a new environment and then migrate. Uh, luckily, we've gotten past that in OpenStack from, for a number of releases where you can do in-place upgrades. Um, and what we basically found is we can stagger the upgrades and with the controllers at redundant services, we can upgrade one, flip over to the other. So we can keep the, keep the upgrades to a minimum. Uh, the other place where we run into it is the hypervisors themselves. That's when you end up having to re reboot nodes because there's a kernel patch or a, uh, or a hypervisor change. So that's where um, you know, making sure the, the Cloud Foundry services and the nodes they're on, what order those come back up, is kind of important to make sure that you can keep, um, keep your instances up and running without having application level out outages. You know, if you have enough DEAs or, or Diego nodes, the idea is you, you know, even if you lose an app instance, you have other ones still running. Um, behind the Go router, so it shouldn't even be be noticeable. Uh, most of the ones are uh, for the minor upgrades, or just a little fix here, a little fix there kind of thing. It's just a, a a service restart basically, and it's usually only a couple seconds, and it's generally unnoticed by by Cloud Foundry. 
Um, and then if there's any config changes, so something we find later that like a, a parameter has to be changed, like for example, we first ran into that API uh, limiting issue, you know, making those changes, again, restart is just a restart of the service, so it's not as bad. Um, again, it's, it's a couple seconds and generally not noticed. So the key takeaway I would say here is automate everything. Automation, automation, automation. It's the only way we're able to keep our OpenStack uh, releases upgradable, supportable, you know, as we, as we support, you know, the number of environments we have. And it's the same thing with Cloud Foundry, right, using Bosch. Well, we put, it, we put all those pieces together. So our Ursula tool that we use to deploy the OpenStack, and then we're using OpenStack as a tool called Rally to run testing against it once it's done to make sure it's, it's ready to go and run all those validation pieces. Um, and then the Cloud Foundry, we, there's a, um, a uh, FOG, there's a uh, Ruby gem called FOG, which will basically discover OpenStack and feed that into our um, Bluemix Cloud Foundry deployment tool, uh, which basically builds the Bosch manifest. So that way, you know, there's no chances for mistyped credentials or anything like that. It, it's, it's discovering it live. Um, you know, making sure that we're, we're finding and, and checking all those, all of those components. And that way, when we go to do the deploys, it'll go and create all the VM configs, create all those on the fly. So all those things I talked about, like the, 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 um, you know, specific flavor size and everything like that, using this, this, uh, automation tool builds all that stuff for us automatically. Uh, pulls down the, the stem cell for the OpenStack environment, generates the manifest, you know, deploys microbosh, does the whole thing, and, and away it goes. So that's kind of how we've been able to do this in a very repeatable fashion. So uh, in customer environments, sometimes it was challenging depending on their underlying IaaS they were giving us, um, presented challenges with deploying Cloud Foundry. Now we, they get this very repeatable, understandable OpenStack environments made it much, been, make deploys much, much quicker. So um, to wrap up here, you know, this is kind of how we deploy it. We use, so we do managed OpenStack and managed Cloud Foundry. So we use this uh, on the blue box level. We use a thing called Site Controller that deploys and manages and upgrades and handles all of the OpenStack stuff. And then on the Bluemix side, it's a similar concept. We call it Relay. So there's basically one local machine that then kicks off all these other pieces. So once we just have these base components in, we can build the entire OpenStack environment and then build the entire uh, Cloud Foundry environment on top of it in a fully automated fashion. So again, the, why customers like Cloud Foundry on OpenStack it, is the fact is you're getting a hundred, you know, an open PaaS environment with Cloud Foundry and an open IaaS environment with OpenStack. Both of them have very strong communities around them, a lot of contributors, a lot of sponsors, you know, besides IBM um, in both spaces. Just the ability to open source community work together and build these things, you know, like that, like the, the OpenStack CPI is now being leveraged by, by not just Bluemix, but Pivotal and ATOS and, and a whole bunch of other companies that are deploying on OpenStack uh, gives them that capability to work together and get you that, that fully open IaaS and PaaS solution. So meeting those installation requirements for Cloud Foundry is, is very straightforward. Once you kind of, once you learn some of these lessons and as you're doing your deploys, it's, it gets much easier. So we've seen the two of them put together make a real difference in our private uh, Cloud Foundry environments, getting this predictable OpenStack layer um, for our clients' environment, so that way we can get a good, clean Cloud Foundry installs and then a good customer experience, right? At the end, it's about the users, the developers' experience, so they want a predictable Cloud Foundry environment, and <coughs> Cloud Foundry needs a predictable IaaS environment, and we get all of that in a, in a open source, uh, easy to use uh, kind of environment. And we are out of time, so. Any questions? <laughs>